All right, and we're live. So welcome everybody to uh, the latest live stream for Fat Dad Fishing. My name is Rich, here with my co-host, Ed. What's going on, Rich? Not much, not much. Uh, th man, th this is going to be an awesome one tonight. Um, we have uh, Chris Matusen on, who, for those that fish anywhere in uh, in New Jersey and like to target striped bass, uh, you've probably seen some of the pictures that he has put up on social media um, and you've seen the results that he had. So very excited that he's going to come on and we're just going to, you know, have a, a conversation, um, you know, about everything land-based fishing for striped bass, you know, for the fall, for uh, the spring, uh, obviously everyone's going to want to focus on the fall right now. Uh, but before we jump into that, Ed, what's been going on the last week or so for you? Not much. I'd like to wish everyone a Merry Togmas Eve. Uh, Tog's opening up to five uh, tomorrow, so getting geared up for that. Um, Wednesday, went out, uh, did a little bit of fishing, caught some quality fish in some, some spots that, uh, you know, actually we're going to hit this week, so excited. Yes, yes, it's. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Um, I, I went out uh, this past weekend with my buddy Derek, uh, and uh, we went for tog, and we we're going to try to hit for some striper, and we got caught in the wind on Saturday. Uh, I just shared with Ed right before this a video that Derek sent to me uh, from you know when we were trying to uh, trying to get back in. So it was not a good situation. It's actually turned a little dicey, a little dangerous comparable comparable to the perfect storm okay <laughs> yeah but we made it back <laughs> in uh actually one of the subscribers actually one of the members of this channel lives down there and we were talking on facebook the whole morning and he said hey wherever you beach i'll bring my truck over so we threw the kayaks in his truck and he got us back to our trucks because we were miles away from where we launched uh we were we were all prepared to get ubers uh an uber to get us over to our truck so we could pick up the kayaks so uh yeah interesting thing that'll be in the video this week um as we dive into this we're going to bring chris on in just a moment everybody uh if you could you know i hate asking this but likes and subscribes actually really the most important thing is likes uh it helps this stream get seen more often to other people that aren't uh familiar with it um and as we go through this this is live for you uh that are here at 9 p.m on monday so ask any questions in the chat and we'll be looking in there and uh, happy to answer them as we go through on the replay. Ask any questions in the comments and I will make sure that uh, well, Ed and I will monitor it. And if there's a direct question for question for Chris, we'll make sure that we get to Chris and uh, get some information back to you as soon as possible. So with that, let's kick it off. We'll bring Chris on stream here. Chris, welcome. Welcome hey guys, to the show. How are you? Pleasure to be welcome, here, Chris very happy that you're that you're on um i'm gonna tell people really the uh i guess the origin story of of how you got here and, and what 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 my perspective is on this episode so um so i have i have seen chris online uh through actually through sod pigs which is a page that he runs on facebook um and, and it was all about uh i think steve uh steve v told me, Hey, you got to check out this page. And, mm -hmm. and I, and I checked it out and, uh, man, uh, for, for a couple of years, uh, maybe it's even been three years that I've been following that. And I keep seeing Chris out there and, you know, I'm banging the sod and he's, he's pulling <laughs> out some solid fish and I'm thinking this guy knows what he's doing. And I, and I was, I really wanted Chris to come on. Uh, but, but my first thought was Chris, this is a guy who is a, um, who's clinical about his fishing. Like right. you, you're into the detail. I, I mean, you can just tell by the posts and the results, like you are studying striped bass. You're studying the areas that you're in, you're studying the conditions. And I wasn't sure if you would be willing to share anything with anyone else because there's a, <laughs> you know, there's that big time on the water yeah, thing. And some right. people are like, no, just go out. But uh, I learned I learned over the past couple of years that you're probably the opposite. You won't tell them this spot, but you will really tell people, hey, these are the things that you want to look for. And, and it looks like you're interested in getting responsible fishermen onto the fish so that they can get out there and uh, enjoy themselves. Yeah, I, I think the biggest part for me is, you know, I, I've put a lot of time in, especially over the last five years doing just the, the side bank thing. Uh, and, and I just don't do fall or spring it's one of those from 
uh, you know, from March 1st all the way through December, uh, we catch them on the side. And, you know, there's been a lot of work put into that and a lot of technique, a lot of prep. And I've talked about that, you know, before how much prep goes into it. But I mean, I, I just live and breathe this and, and it's just something it's a huge passion of mine. And, um, you know, I'm already thinking right now about my next outing and, you know, how we're going to go about that. So, um, no, I mean, listen, I had guys help me out along the way and, you know, point me to a spot or two. And, but, you know, I think when you really, really get a chance to go out on your own, which I, I very seldom fish with anybody. And, and it's not really because of the spot burn thing. I mean, most of the guys that I do fish with, um, they're just as protective of areas as I am. Um, you know, it's, it's just more about kind of just sharing a little bit of information. Cause I know I had a tough go of it for a while, but once certain things start to click and uh, you see patterns develop year after year and for certain areas, it's, um, you know, when you put that initial work in, it's okay. But, you know, I've spent years, uh, you know, months out of the year, uh, not as a waste of time, but, you know, I really, really pick my spots when to go now. Um, sometimes I'll, I won't go for weeks at a time because I don't like the moon or I just don't like certain tide heights on certain, uh, side banks. But, you know, I've learned to fish smarter now and not harder, not that we don't fish hard, but, um, you know, a lot of those days of just going out just to go, uh, uh, you know, I, I kind of don't do a whole lot of that anymore. Right. I just really pick those really prime opportunities and target those. And, and I've been really, you know, really, really successful. And, and this year was definitely one of those years, especially midsummer was fantastic for me. So, you know, I, I, I think you bring up an interesting point. So the, the time on the water is a big thing, but um, I think you look at time on the water a little bit differently. I know I do. Um, and I, I actually have a video where I say time on the water doesn't matter. And, and what I'm, right. what I'm claiming in that is, um, you know, people say, just go out and fish and put in your time. Well, that, it has to be productive time, right? Correct. If, Correct. if you're just going to go down and you're going to hit one side bank and you're going to fish it through every tide for eight hours, 12 hours, um, that that's putting in time, but that's the wrong kind of time, right? You, you need to understand yeah. what you're looking for and right. you need to be, you need to make the most of the time that you have out there. Yeah. I think that I, I believe that that's kind of pointless. I mean, I don't really go much more than an hour and a half. That's usually my window. My window is probably even smaller than that, maybe like 40 minutes. I, I know, right? But see, I'm lucky because the furthest spot I fish is, is about 12 minutes from my house. So, yeah. um, you know, I, I, I got it made. The location I live at, I live right outside Summers Point, between Summers Point and, and Egg Arbor Township border. Um, but, you know, I, uh, many days, years ago, out there for two, three, four hours, and you say, oh, man, we were here yesterday. I'm just, you know, if I throw long enough, something is going to show up. And, and that's, um, sometimes that's the case, but, you know, I found that uh, year after year, if I just choose these certain windows and certain locations, they tend to pay off. And, you know, I used to kind of get, um, not uptight, but, you know, antsy about going like, oh man, um, uh, let me just go just to go. Well, now yeah. I'll occupy myself with something else, either with my cars or I'll, I'll find another activity because that, that, you know, I used to go at low tide. That's a great time to go, uh, you know, to really kind of check out the water, look at the flats, see, you know, where there's structure. But, um, yeah, uh, small windows and that's it. But I agree back to your point about the, the, the time on the water. A lot of that can be wasted time. Right. So, you know, I, I see guys that, you know, they're out there. Oh, I've been out here four hours and having a touch. Well, I don't know why you're still out there after four hours because four hours I'm already home doing another activity or I'm back in bed or, or whatnot. But, um, you know, like this summer, uh, there were times where there was a 20 minute window and uh, 20 minutes it happens, it shuts down. And I go back the next day, just follow the tide another hour later for 20 minutes. And, and that's that. I mean, I, I obviously enjoy it enough where I could stay out there for hours, but you know, I'd rather go back to Pennsylvania and, and, and trout fish all day. If I'm going to spend all day on the water right. down here, when you're going to, you know, you're lugging a side bank in the, the middle of summer when it's 95 degrees, I'm not, I'm not baking out there for three hours, nor, you know, is that window going to last that long, especially, you know, when the water's hot and, and fish are finicky, but yeah, the, you, you got to put the time in 
but I spent a lot of dumb time for a couple of years and right. I wish I would have had that time back and fish a little smarter. So, yeah, I, I think we've all had our share of dumb time. Ed, you have any dumb time in your, in your recent past? Recently? Uh, yeah, I spent a couple, a couple hours chasing some, some stripers that, you know, weren't there or just, I wasn't throwing the right thing. Yeah. Um, you know, but it's all learning. I, I take it as a learning experience, especially having the tackle company and stuff. If I don't catch, you know, then I'm at least learning, um, you know, ways to work the lures and change change up my presentation, right. and maybe I will catch something. So, right, you know, and, and what for me, it's do. not so much wasted. Yeah, I and and I'm I'm the different uh, type, Chris. I, I'm I'm in Pennsylvania, and I'm you've mentioned some you know, some people in the past and on social media. So I know you fish with a lot of Pennsylvania guys. Right. Um, so, you know, for, for me, it's an hour and a half to two and a half hours, depending on what time of year it is. So yep. when I'm going down, I'm, I'm down for the day and I'm usually sure. on the water eight to 12 hours. Right. Um, you know, I get my one day a week. Um, but, but what I do is I try to be smart about it. So um, I went out this past weekend with uh, my buddy, Derek and, he wanted to go for striper. I was like, eh, it's not going to be great, but that's South wind. Um, now the wind didn't end up being where it was supposed to be, but, um, right. So we fished for striper early and then we hit tog for a while. And then I said, okay, you know, before this wind really kicks up, uh, let's, let's hit these spots, which should be decent for midday stripe bass. Yep. And we, we didn't get a touch and then we got blasted by the wind and, and everything. Um, but, you know, th that to me was, you know, the striped bass was not, that was not going to be a striped bass day um, at all. It just, the, the conditions just weren't right for the area that we were going to be in. And those are probably the days that I pass on now. Like uh, if it's just, if the conditions are just that bad and it's just not going to, you know, I, I don't look for ideal conditions, but if it's just definitely not going to happen based on, you know, some of the wind that we've had the last couple of weeks, uh, you know, especially out front in the surf, the, the wind has just been horrendous. And, and I was talking to a buddy yesterday and, you know, there's so many missed opportunities uh, this fall. The tide was right, uh, lined up with dusk or dawn, you know, whatever the case was, uh, good rips, same thing in the back, but, but the wind just uh, has just played havoc. But the last couple of years though, wind has been a problem, especially in the spring. Um, you know, I, I love some wind because I definitely believe some of the best striped bass fishing is when you have, especially in the back on the, on yeah. the flat is when you have some chop. Right. Uh, in the summer, it's imperative because just still dead water with no oxygen going through it, you know, when the water is 80 some degrees, they tend not to come up and, 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 and feed in that shallow water. But you know, we had a couple of days in, in August where we had uh, those mid afternoon tornado warnings and uh, fishing for me was lights out. Uh, yeah. I, I went to a spot that, that is a good uh, May and June producer for me when you still got some migratory fish coming along front, but they'll you know, also come through the bay and uh, same spot. I, I went and tried it uh, in August and usually that spot shuts down by the second week of June, but it produced all summer this year. And I wound up getting some nice 35, 37 inch fish uh, 95 degrees. Yeah. Heat index was 98 yeah. degrees. Sun, <laughs> sun, uh, sun out. And, uh, this was the, uh, this is, this is one of the best that this Yozuri hydro minnow yeah. has changed the game. You know, before it was just the, uh, the SP. Well, this, this one here with the, the fatter profile and it swims shallower. Yeah. When I can do a, a, a spook or a, uh, tactic anglers crossover or, or a hydro, uh, from, uh, from Missouri. That's the, that's the go-to right below the surface. And, and all summer that, that lure was lights out with the biggest fish. It's crazy yeah. how, how great it was. And like at, at top speed, top speed, as fast as you could crank it with the, a 15 mile an hour East wind in your face. It was, it was crazy, but that, that lure is fantastic. But you know, that there's a spot that uh, let's go back four years ago. Um, you couldn't go wrong for like a five week period in the spring, uh, late spring. It was just a, a really good producer, uh, nobody around cause it's a far away spot. Uh, I've yet to see one person around except guys that, you know, are really diehards that kind of know, you know, where to go out there. But, um, 
was really good for a couple of years. And then the last two years, I really didn't do anything there. I went back the last couple of springs and nothing. Last year, not a touch. And something told me this year, hey, you know what? Um, other spots been producing good. Let's check this out again. And last week of May, same thing. It was just, it, it was nuts. The, the, the more the wind blew in, the higher that tide came for a 45 to a 50 minute window. Uh, I had a buddy out there with me and, and they were just, if you were throwing a spook, uh, that's all they wanted. He was throwing poppers. They weren't touching it. I yeah. was throwing a spook. It was every, every cast. And, and we're talking, you know, some fish were 35, 37 inches. Uh, average size was probably 28 to 30. And I definitely hooked a couple fish that were over 40 inches probably. Um, but they were hooked in, uh, they were sitting in these little cuts and these little coves and with the casting angle, um, when you set the hook and they run a certain way, you just yeah. couldn't get, you know, you couldn't keep them on. But, um, yeah, I mean, you know, back Bay is just a lot of, uh, a lot of boots on the ground. And, but I grew up fishing freshwater trout streams. And what I've learned is a lot of that stuff rolls over into bass, uh, ambush points, yep. current eddies. So, you know, I, I was talking to a buddy of mine the other day. He's like, Oh, you know, uh, my, uh, you know, my uncle wants to fish with you. Can I give him your number? Well, sure. We could fish together, but it, it's, you know, when you start putting certain factors together, um, to me, I think it's better when you figure it out yourself. I mean, yeah, we could go, we could hang out and I'll show you a couple of things, but you know, when you, when you kind of go back to when you're a kid and I remember where my father used to take me and certain places we would fish for trout and certain places they would sit behind rocks or, you know, below uh, a fast water chute or some rapids and stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I use the same stuff when I look for bass spots and, and it's really the same. It's, it's no different. Yeah. I, I think a lot of people, they forget that. Right. And, and especially I think with yep. striper, you know, they, they, they think, well, they're migrating. So it's all luck. Okay. There is some luck. Um, you, you have right. to be, if, sure. if you're, especially if you're on the beach in the back though, it's, a, you know, to me in the back, it's a little bit different. First of all, they're there near, well, they're there all year. Right. Um, doesn't mean you can catch them all year, but sure. they're there. Um, but, but you have to remember even the migrating fish, they're, they're not just going straight up and down the coast. They're following bunker pots. They're feeding right. as they're migrating. So, so what's going to draw the bunker in or the bait fish or the mullet, especially in, um, you know, if, if you're on the surf, where's the cut? You got to look for where the bait fish are going to be because they're going to ambush them. They're amb they are ambush predators. Right. They're, they're going to come, they're going to look for everything they can, they can use. They're very, uh, they're very inclined to structure. I mean, they're called rockfish in other areas for a reason. It's because right. they love the Correct. structure. They love the ambush. And yep. um, people need to approach it that way. If you can catch a flounder and you know why you're catching a flounder in a certain spot, not just drifting the middle of a, a channel, but you know how to find spots, you will be able to find out where a striped bass is. You will be able to find out where weak fish are. Um, the same thing with, uh, with bass and trout, right? I mean, there, there are reasons that they're there. Um, and I think that's, you know, to your point though, it's great, you know, it's great when you can find it on your own and you can say, wait, this should work and here's why. And then you get to test it. So I definitely appreciate that about fishing. And, and you know, I, I very, very rarely engage in conversations where it's like, well, just tell me where you went so I can go there. Right. Uh, now, a lot of people yeah. ask me that, but, you know, I try to, you know, even in my videos, I'm like, it's not the spot. They're like, was it here? And like, it doesn't matter. Just look at what I'm telling you. Look at how the bottom is. Find bottom like that next to this type of point, and you're going to find the fish. It doesn't matter where I was at that point. Um, yeah, and I, and I think reading that structure is is probably the number one key. You yeah. know, you could talk tides. We could talk wind and all that. But if you don't know how to read side banks and kind of know where that structure is, same thing in the surf. If you don't know where the trough is or you don't know where, you know, the, the, the rip is forming – you could stand there all day and, and be a half a block away or you could be on, they could be right in front of you on the side bank. But if your casting angle isn't correct and your retrieve speed is not uh, what it needs to be, uh, you could stand there all day and have them in front of you but, and, and you'll just never hook up. So, you know, reading the structure uh, 
you know, I, I can't stress the importance enough of that, but you know, a lot of the banks that I go on, uh, there are certain techniques that work and there are certain ones that don't. I mean, I was telling you about the spook and, you know, my buddy was throwing, you know, a, a ton of other stuff. Those fish were right there. They were right there in front of us. Some of them were, you know, uh, 30 some inch fish were, uh, maybe 10 feet off the bank. And, you know, he was cast after cast after cast, nothing. And, you know, you throw that spook out there and it was getting busted every time. Uh, you got to look at the way the current comes around the side bank. I mean, it's no secret that, you know, points are obviously, you know, a good spot on an outgoing tide. I mean, that's been commercialized for years now. Hey, you know, hit a side bank at, at outgoing tide and that's the ticket. Well, there's a little more to it than that. I mean, if it was that easy, everybody yeah. would be out there doing it regardless of the conditions. And, you know, I think there's bass on every bank, but I mean, they're not going to be around the entire bank. They're, a lot of times they're just going to be staged up in certain spots and, you know, you just need to know how to read it. But the, the self gratification thing of, of finding it on your own, that's the, um, that's the great thing for me is uh, being able to do that and, and still continuing to do that. You know, and even if it's not straight bass, if I, you know, I'll, I'll be back down in Dominican Republic next week fishing for tarpon and snook again down there. And, you know, I found this bite a couple of years ago and um, I knew they were there, but uh, my first time fishing for them was a little difficult. I just kept throwing certain lures. And, but I mean, uh, once I figured it out, it's a, a ridiculous experience, but a lot of the techniques I use there is the same thing I use for striped bass up here. The, the lures aren't the, the lures don't change. Right. They're exactly the same. Uh, some of the areas I fish, especially for snook down there in the surf or, or back on the, uh, the landlocked ones, same thing with the, you know, current coves, cuts, drop offs, you know, anywhere there's cover, but um, you know, the, the striped bass thing just is, is, is gotten really big in this area. Um, that's a good thing. Cause I think it just, you know, I like to see people out fishing. I like to see people, you know, it, it's a great pastime and, and a great enjoyment to have, but, you know, I think we need a little more conservation also, especially yeah. in the back because that's, and that's one reason, honestly, why I don't talk about it too much. And, and a few years ago, I started talking uh, to some people, I would do a post or two or a photo and, you know, I got blasted for it a couple of times. Say, Hey, you know, do you understand the impact of this? And it only took me maybe one season to figure out the impact because you just see every year now the decline, the decline, the decline right. in the back bay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, migratory fish, fish, if you're out in a boat, Raritan Bay, you're going to say, hey, what are you talking about shortage? There's no shortage. I mean, it's uh, lights out up here. If you're on the borderline in New York, no, nah, there's no shortage of big fish up here. And well, I, those are fish that, you know, a lot of those are centralized in that area. A lot of the migratory fish, I mean, they're, you know, the, like you were talking about bunker pods. I mean, there's a ton of bait up there. That's one thing we lack down here right now is bait. So that's one reason where it's tough to draw them in. But, um, you know, if everybody was able to do this uh, and be successful all the time, the, the people think the back bay is wiped out now. It would be totally wiped out. I mean, right. it's, uh, you know, I, I haven't kept the fish in, I want to say uh, probably three and a half years. I caught two back-to-back 37-inch -back, uh, bass the end of July, three years ago. Um, the second one I couldn't revive and, and was kind of hooked kind of bad. So that one had to be a sacrifice. But other than right. that, I haven't, I haven't kept a bass in 20 years, and I don't have any desire to. Uh, you know, I just think that they're worth more swimming away than they are putting them on the table. And again, I have a lot of disagreements with people about that. You know, oh, what's the matter with providing for your family? I, I don't know. Go eat something else. I mean, striper tastes good, but it, it's not worth to me um, sacrificing the stock that we do have. I was seeing some, some posts the other day and, you know, uh, live spot is a really good bait for right now in the back bay and, you know, the water gets cold. You have these cold fronts that get down in the deeper water. And, you know, it's great, man. They're out there catching a lot of fish, but we're also sacrificing a lot of fish with this uh, bonus tag program and everything else. And, you know, there's no wardens out anymore. I mean, you don't see any uh, game wardens out. You see like maybe three stories a year that get posted on Facebook of guys that were caught poaching or over limit or whatever. Uh, 
know, if we had more of that, maybe some of it would stop. But, you know, there's spots in December that I see every night I drive by and there's guys fishing in those bread baskets up on top of bridges. And to, in my opinion, maybe yeah. I'm wrong. People are different. There's only one reason why you're fishing there. You know, you're, 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 you're catching dinks out of the channel and, you know, they're, they're, they're getting hauled all the way up and they're putting them in bags and they're taking them away. So, I mean, yeah, they're, they're running them into the trunk of the car. And, you know, I, I actually, I think it was last summer. It wasn't this summer. I ran into a uh, New Jersey conservation officer for the first time in my life. Um, mm -hmm. I'm 48 and I've been, uh, since I was born, I've been going to Stone Harbor up until the past couple of right. years. Um, never once did I ever meet in person or see in person a conservation officer. Guy came up to me and I was so excited. Crazy. I said, do you, I said, you want to see my registry? He's like, no. <laughs> I was like, oh, you want to yeah. check my fish? He's like, did you catch any? I was like, yeah. And he's like, congrats. He's like, I'm not here for you. <laughs> he's like, who, who around here is not doing what they're supposed to do? And I said, you know what? I'm, I'm not sure. I just got my kayak out of the water. I said, but you might want to check over there because they got a minivan and, and twice somebody's come back to it um, yes. with something. And uh, he was down there for a while. So I think he, I think he found some people pulling it and they were using a cast net. So. Um, it's horrible. I, yeah. You know, I, I just don't, and in the river, it's the same way in the spring. I mean, you know, and in, in, in March and April, you know, when you got the schoolies that are starting to bite, you can't tell me all those fish are being released either. I mean, I, I fished yeah. the Great Egg Harbor River a lot. And, uh, you know, compared to 25 years ago, uh, we don't get we don't get any run up there compared to what we used to have. Um, and whether that's because of fish depletion or you know, maybe they just don't run up there as spawn anymore. I don't, I don't know. You know, we, we, we outlawed, uh, you know, we can't live line herring anymore. Not that I ever really did it that much, but you know, they said, Oh, well, there's a herring shortage. Right. So we don't have as many fish going up there to, you know, chasing bait to listen, there's no herring shortage. I've seen herring the last couple of years that, you know, you could walk across the great egg Harbor river from one side to the other on it. And, and not, you know, we're talking, you know, herring that are, you know, yeah, they're big size. They're huge. So, yeah. yeah, there's no shortage of those. I mean, you know, I, I did get one about th a, a 30 pound bass two years ago out of there on a plug, uh, like two feet in front of me, just, just whale to Yozuri, broken back that I was, uh, yeah, so great fish like up on the flat. But other than that, I mean, I haven't caught in, I haven't caught many fish out of the river, uh, you know, over, uh, over 30, 35 inches. And, you know, I'm out there a lot in the spring and I'm out there at, uh, uh, at a really, really good, private spot that, that I go out there with a buddy of mine. And, um, again, years ago it was kind of lights out, but now it's, you know, you got to put a lot of extra work in and, uh, you know, we, a lot of us put a lot of that time on the water. So, you know, do we want to share that? No, do we want to, you know, uh, yeah, there's enough of fish to go around. I, I don't really believe that either. So you kind of just keep it tight to the cuff and, you know, you don't give too much out, but, you know, I know there's a lot of, you know, younger anglers that, you know, they want to get started in fishing and they go and, uh, uh, you know, they don't catch anything and they get burned down and say, oh, no, nah, you know, I, I don't catch anything. I, I don't even want to go fishing. Um, so, you know, if we can help a couple people and just, you know, talk about some lures and, you know, kind of just things to look for. I mean, you know, that's that, that's kind of what I try to do now and just kind of give some generic information because, I mean, I wasn't really given detailed information. And, uh, you know, I made the mistake of asking a few guys back years ago, hey, you know, where did you go? I really <laughs> caught a yeah. caught a tough time. But again, I, I didn't, I wasn't doing it enough at that point because I, I kind of, I, I did the bodybuilding thing for like 20 years. I kind of got away from fishing for, for a long time. And but when I got hurt, you know, five years ago, I, I had to give that up. So, you know, I, I really got back into this heavy. And, um, but in that time gap, you know, you went from really, really, really good fishing to like, this, this horrible depletion, which we see now, then I understood they're like, listen, this is not the way it was before. So we're not going to talk about this. We're not going to talk about spots. We're not going to talk about, you know, uh, a whole lot of anything, but, um, you know, the stock definitely is a problem, but, uh, you know, we definitely need to do things to, to, to fix that. Cause I'm afraid in another four or five years, uh, we're going to be in really, really bad shape, uh, back in the Bay and, you know, that's a, uh, you know, flounder is another issue. 
you know, we talk about, you know, the you go out, catch 50 flounder, right? And, and, and you got three legal size ones there. You know, why is that? Is that because there's just a shortage of adult flounder? Is there a shortage because, uh, you know, people kept everything at one time? I don't, I don't know. Weak fish is the same way. You oh, know, in the late 90s. Devastated. Yeah. The late 90s, I mean, you they're, could go off any side back, though. Well, the smaller ones are, I mean, you know, but, but, you know, we could in the late nineties, early two thousands, we could go on any side bank from Long Beach Island, you know, down, uh, way past where I live and, you know, eight, nine, 10 pounders schools of them were, were not rare at that point. Yeah. You know, even in the surf, you know, it was, wasn't bad to go out there and, and, and catch a couple or in the inlets uh, a couple years ago, I got one, you know, she was dead for a couple hours before I, um, and that wasn't a striped bass. So it's keeping the one fish in 20 years, the weak right. fish is the exclusion, but that was 31, uh, 30 and a half inches and, uh, and eight pounds. That was after she was dead for a couple hours. But, um, I, you just, you don't see weak fish that size. No. So, no. so the, the, the spikes are kind of making a comeback, but again, you know, like, Oh, that, that one fish limit. But a lot of people I see catching those spikes is, uh, got that one fish. How much are you really getting off of that one fish? So to yeah, me, they're sacrifice they're ones. Yeah, sacrificing that fish to me, uh, I, I just don't, I don't get it. You know, I yeah, have a I, spot. Yeah, I, I have a spot in September that I go every year, and I can get bass, uh, flounder, and weak fish all mixed in together. Uh, it's a nice little tidal pool. Um, I could see other people fishing, but you know they kind of don't bother with me, and they probably think, oh, this guy's all the way out there; he's really not getting anything. But really, it's the opposite. You know, there's a maybe a half hour, 40 minute window on, on certain moons and it produces real well. And I have never thought about keeping a weak fish. And last year I got one 25, 26 inches. I never thought about keeping it this year. I got a one night. I got in a nice school of them every single one back in the water. So I don't, maybe it's just mentality. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I just, I just don't see the, the logic and all that. I don't, I don't get it. I think it has to do with the angler and, and the ethics that they're even raised with, you know, you, you see people, right. you know, when they're, when they're doing their poaching thing and whatever, you see little kids involved. So they, they learn it from a small, a, you know, a young age. Right. Um, I think they're just, I think people that do that kind of stuff, they're just not, you know, not on the up and up to begin with. So they're just going to do whatever they want. And like trout fish when we were a kid, I mean, we were always, so I go with my father, we'd always keep our limit. Always keep our limit and, you know, go home, cook them up. Even when, uh, my first couple of years I after I moved down here after high school, still go back there and I still go back there and fish every year. And for a while we were still keeping fish, bringing them home, eating them. But I just got old after a while. I mean, you, you saw that every year they started stocking less. It was harder and harder to catch. So it's like, hey, you know what? If I could put these couple back in and they turn out to, you know, stay in here for a couple more years, grow a little bit bigger give somebody else some pleasure of catching them. I mean, that's kind of the satisfaction I get now. I've, I posted a lot of videos this year of a lot of fish being released and, um, you know, you slow motion them and you get the big tail wave and, he, you know, they're splashing out of the water. I mean, I just, you know, I, I just, there's something in me that that kind of went off maybe 10 or 15 years ago that I just loved, I just love to release fish. I just think it's just such a, you know, hey, you did me a solid, you got on the end of my line, you know, you gave me a good five or 10 minutes and, you know, here's the way I pay you back. And, and now I let you go to swim another day. I mean, obviously some fish get, you know, they, they get you know, foul hooked or bad hooked. I mean, that's just kind of, you know, the way yep. nature runs. But, um, you know, we talk about that bonus pet tag program. Uh, a lot of guys I know, they'll buy those tags and not use them just to, you know, because there's only a certain number that are given out. But, you know, mm. I, I don't. I don't know, you know, certain bait shops, you know, they, they, they promote all that and, yeah and whatever, but, but uh, at the same time, I look at it as well, you know, that's great. You need to make a business, but if you're helping to deplete the population, well, that's only going to hurt you in the long run. But I think it's just a, more about that immediate gratification and sales and, and, you know, I'm, I'm friends with just about every bait shop owner. So, I mean, that's, it, you know, they, they run their business the way they run it, but, um, yeah, it's that's that's a tough, uh, just a tough pill for me to swallow, and that's a lot of why I fish alone too, is I don't want to see people keeping fish. Uh, certain areas I just don't go to. Um, they produce real well, but I'd rather go out by myself and and um, 
and just do the experience that way. I just don't want to see, you know, those, those fish being killed at this point, especially bass. So, yeah, I, I, uh, I think I keep about one bass a year. It's usually because I, uh, hooked it bad and it didn't revive. Yep. Um, and you're also driving, driving two hours to come down and fish eight hours. So, so it's okay then at that point. Well, <laughs> I, I actually don't think it is okay. I, I mean, personally, for me, right? I, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I take this stance. Um, if it's legal, I'm not going to complain if you do it. Right. Um, you know, unless there's some really weird situation. I don't know. There, there's probably an exception. Uh, weak fish, I will not keep a weak fish again unless it won't right. revive. I actually right. stopped targeting them. Um but interestingly enough, the, the recruitment on those is positive um, for this, I think, the third year in a row. Correct. So, Numbers are looking a lot better. Right? Yeah, they are looking better. So I, I have hope for those. That was my grandfather's favorite fish to go for. We used to go blue fishing. And his favorite thing was when you found the blues, you had to get under them because that's where the weak fish were uh, offshore. So and, they just, and they just fight a totally different way. Too. Oh, they do. They, they kind of fight mm -hmm. like freshwater trout. They just, yep. they just, you know, they just... That, da, 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 da. and then once you set the hook they just you know immediately start running they're gone we used, we used to get we used to get them up uh we used to climb down on the icebreakers the last bridge going into long beach island on uh on the uh the road going in there we would pull off and park at the restaurant underneath we would walk all the way up on top of the bridge yeah and uh, and and cut the locks on the icebreakers and go all the way down and, and we'd get down there for outgoing tide and i mean we had weak fish down there that this was before, I guess, most people started using braid. So we were still using mono. And, uh, you know, some of them were just so big. As soon as you immediately set the hook, they just bite right through the line with yep, the, the, yep. You know, the fangs. Yeah. Um, I love to see those days come back. You know, maybe if they keep it at one fish limit and, you know, people start throwing some of those smaller ones back, we'll, we'll see those days again. But, yeah, I, unfortunately, I, I think th those really, really good weak fish days, I think they're – I don't think we'll ever see that again, but you know, if you could bring back a stock where, Hey, let's go out and see, if we can get a couple weak fish tonight and actually target them and actually get a couple instead of just like incidental catches in between bass or flounder. I, that'd be great. Cause that's a great fish to catch. Yeah. See, yeah. Now we, we did have those nights in the spring with the weak fish. There was a good solid week that that's really all we were catching out on the jetties. Nice. Yeah. Um, I did see a lot of fish go home. Um, but I don't even know why people keep them. They don't taste good to me. But yeah, um, I think they taste okay, but they don't keep at all. Like you, you need to eat it immediately. Right away. Right. Right. Yeah. You don't want to freeze that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure somebody's figured out a way to do it. Um, you know, they, they have a great fight. I'll, I'll throw them all back. Um, I, I actually prefer to now, <laughs> instead of weak fish, I actually try to target specs and reds up here. Um, you know, they, they're really, really yep. hard to get. They're here. They're really hard to get and hard to find, but that's that's kind of what I've been doing. And actually, I came up uh, empty on both in New Jersey this year. I've caught some further south uh, in Maryland, but n not a uh, not up here. But you know, I, but 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 that's the way that I look at. So so back to the to the keeping them and letting them go. Um, you know, I I'm not big on keeping a lot of fish. I do keep flounder, um, uh, but I don't keep my limit all the time. And I do throw back. Uh, a, a really good percentage right. of uh of the keeper size especially some of the bigger ones there's nothing better than catching your limit meaning whatever you planned on keeping for the day and then throwing back a 24 25 incher you absolutely know? you know you see the 18 inch sitting on your stringer and you're like all right you're going back and i'm going to look yep. for you next year love that yeah and you know it's it's why it, it brings up you know the, the spring and you know the spring was uh this was probably one of the better springs that there that has been in a, a long time especially for yeah. for bass i mean may and june was just uh r r ridiculous the, the the size of the fish the amount of fish um just a, a, a enormous amount all up and down the beach um you know but I, i'm just not a crowd guy i i don't like to fish around a lot of people and you know again i stayed back in, in on the side and i did really good back there you know i uh you know 40 45 50 inch fish and that's you know that's a trophy fish anywhere um you know but i was getting them you know 10 let's, inches shy let's or, show some it, 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 you know 10 inches shy in the back and uh yeah you know nobody around um most of the pictures i take are selfies because there's nobody 
you know, with me once in a while, I have somebody there that can get a nice shot. Yeah. But, you know, so that one right there, uh, that was the first one, uh, three years ago in July, it, a buddy of mine was out with me and we fished for a couple hours, uh, from uh, right around dawn tide wasn't high enough yet. And he said, oh, I'm going to go down the road for a while. And I stuck it out 10 minutes later, back to back 37 inches, but yeah. And, and all those fish are showing there. They're probably, uh, not even 15 minutes apart from each other. It's funny. Some of those pictures, I don't remember where they were because my selfies are, uh, I just will not burn a spot. That's yeah. actually a fantastic bass right there. That was a surf caught bass on a local beach last fall. This was, uh, the end of May this year. That was a 37 inch on the side back there. Yeah. A, and on, on and that, spook. that to me is like the cool thing because uh, you would, you talk to a lot of people and they would swear you can't catch that on the side, but, but you do. It's just and, that and, most people are just back there dunking bait thinking that they're going to be picking those up, but that's not how they're behaving when they're back there. So, and, and, and this one, junk. and this one right here was August in one of those tornado warnings right there. That was a 32 inch. That was, that was on the beach down here this fall. Everybody last fall, everybody said, Oh, there's no beach. They're replenishing. Well, I, you know, I, I looked out and not didn't luck out, but you know, I, I kept reading the beach and uh, found some, some, some cuts that didn't look like anywhere else. And they were loaded with fish, especially speckled trout were there too. And this was yeah. the, the biggest one I got uh, this summer. It was 98 degrees. I wish you could see like how wet my shirt was, but I was just, I was soaked. That's two 30 in the afternoon. And that's a 37 inch on, on a, uh, on a hydro minnow top, top speed in, in two and a half feet of water crazy well yeah and that and i love how you blur the background there um <laughs> and it's a shame because like i it's it's such a better picture without that blur right um but you know that's you for you yeah when you don't blur it and you're a local uh, yeah. some people still won't realize where it's at but yeah i mean i know that i'm not gonna you know front from it i know years ago i looked at people's pictures and said man i'm i'm zooming in i'm looking at this little piece of grass here uh, what does this condo look like? And then you go on Google maps and uh, listen, if you look hard enough, you can figure out where it's at. But you know, this, that's one of those spots there where I'm just not, uh, in a position to, to give that spot up. And, you know, it right. doesn't always produce, but for me, midsummer, uh, I, I can still get, uh, spring size fish in the summertime when the conditions are right. So that's, that's definitely a fantastic, uh, fantastic spot. That's beautiful fish too man absolutely yeah um, and and that one and another one like there's no broken lines on those fish at all you know i don't whether they were you know migrant migrating early or whatever the case was but they definitely were not riverborne fish that was in the surf last year too um yeah we found some specks mixed in we found uh uh a big redfish mixed in yeah uh, you know you see a lot of smaller ones out front or you see the bigger ones that people take on bait but it was a, uh, I didn't catch it. I was a block down. I was with uh, Lee and uh, Seth Wakefield. And, uh, was Seth it Seth Senior. that caught it? Of, of course it is. Uh, yeah. Why would it be anybody else? <laughs> um, and it was a legit like 28 to 30 incher. That was a, just, just a beast of a bass right there. Uh, November last year, same place on the beach. Uh, that's, that's Back Bay. Uh, I think that's, that was uh, November last year. Um, I was still getting them on top order in November. That's uh, that's May of, I think, four years ago. Uh, I went up in the surf earlier in the night. Wind was too bad. It was all weedy. Met my buddy back in the bay, and uh, Mag Darters were the ticket. So, so, so let's let's talk about that real quick. So, um, one thing that I'm noticing is uh, you're using um, the larger baits and or the larger lures in the back. You're not using Correct. Spook Juniors, are you? Yeah, let me Just let me the change the screen up real quick so people can see this. The regular size. This is the same. So it's a regular size, the, the saltwater edition ones. But these are the same ones I target like world class tarpon with when I go on vacation. So and you can see, I mean, it's just it's just like tour to hell. I've I've caught so many fish on this plug, but um, no, I don't I don't shrink down at all. Um, you know, the same thing like with the hydro minnow. Uh, the same size I use in the surf, I use in the back. Uh, this is a smaller Missouri hydro popper, but, um, you know, it's still one ounce, uh, yeah. four inches, but they make a five and a half inch, I think it is. And we were actually catching more on that, 
then on this one, yeah, I, I think a lot of people scale down, you know, the tactical angler one, um, the crossover popper. But no, I, I again, I think the assumption is, is, hey, the bay always holds smaller fish. Uh, you know, in some regards, you know, they're not quite as big as out front, but if you want big fish, you know, I listen, these uh, Northeast jigs, my guys there have been so generous to me over the last couple of years. I mean, these are, these are lights out uh, all, all year round. But if I'm going to go for big fish, I, I've learned to throw bigger plugs and, and they'll produce. I mean, you, know, you got to remember how big the mouth is. And even if you're yeah. using a six or an eight inch plug, you got to fish w with a mouth this big. Well, what's a six or an eight inch plug? It, you, it's, they just inhale it. So especially when you can find some adult bunker uh, coming through the side banks in the early spring, uh, you know, you want to throw a plug that's that size. You start throwing those little dink ones. It won't even give them any notice. Uh, top order plugs are the same way. You know, the bigger wake that I'm causing, the more commotion, uh, th that seems to be what they follow. So small lures in the back are just in, in the river early, early on when it's still cold, I'll use smaller lures, but once the water starts to warm up, um, no, I, I don't scale down. So not at all. We are getting some questions flowing through. I don't know if you yeah. want to, uh, shoot through them. Uh, James is asking, Chris, do you always use, uh, artificials and, I think we know yes, that. Yes, correct. Yeah, I haven't used uh, I haven't used bait or live bait in uh, probably four years. The only the last time I used live bait was when we had that big bluefish run in Atlantic City, I guess 2016, where you know it's just every day it was 10, 15 pounders, and I you know I was using chunks, but then once uh, you know they started hitting plugs, we went right to plugs. But for bass though, uh, I, I don't use. I don't eel fish. You know, I know that eels are great for, for big bass. And that was the big bite this year in certain areas was the eel bite. But, you know, and again, I'm not, I hope nobody takes you know, my perspective as, you know, Hey, he's cracking on certain guys where that's just not the way I enjoy to fish. Right. I enjoy, you know, a, Chris Balaban who owns tight lines in Summers point, we had a conversation a couple months ago and, and he said, he phrased it exactly the way, hope he didn't copyright this, but ex this is exactly the way you look at it. You create a strike when you use an artificial. You create that strike. When you use live bait or, or, or stick bait, it's not that way. You create that strike so the strikes are more ferocious, and to me, it's more, it's more rewarding. But no, it's, it's artificial for me. Even when the water's uh, you know 40 degrees in the back, or if it's a really, really cold winter and, and, and March 1st comes, I, I don't throw blood worms. I don't. No, nah, I get them on official year round. So, yeah, and and look, it's it's all of what you prefer, right? Um, we had Bayside mm -hmm. Dave on. He's a bait, bait right? Exactly. Very yep. successful. Yep. Um, Very successful. Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and you know what? Listen, there's a lot of missed opportunities, probably where I don't catch because I don't do the bait thing, but but I'm okay with that. Yeah. Because again, it's it's more rewarding. Uh, for me personally, the way I fish, um, again, that's, you know, it's okay. And, and I used to fish that way. I mean, I, and even when I freshwater fish, I still fish that way. Sometimes I take my son out, we use minnows, we use shiners, you know, whatever the case is, no roaches. But when I target bass, I just think it's, uh, it's better strikes and, uh, it's, it's just better for me when I use them this way. It's more challenging. So. Yeah, I, I think it definitely is more challenging. At least it is for me. And it's versatile. I mean, you know, you, you got the hydro that that goes, you know, down to two feet. I mean, I just usually do it right below the surface. The tactical angle crossover popper. I mean, you can do surface. You can do subsurface. Um, the, the, the spook for me this year, if I didn't, if I wasn't using spooks this year, I wouldn't have caught probably eighty percent of the fish that I did. It's it's crazy how you could throw a popper, they wouldn't touch it, but you threw a spook. I, and they couldn't stay off of it. That, that, that's, you know, and, and, and that's, an, it, it, it's not the easiest. I mean, it took me years to figure out, you know, how to work a spook really, really good. Um, so, you know, you, you tend to work it too fast, too slow, too much slack in the line, you know, a, a fast action rod versus a medium action rod. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you got to figure it out. But when you can figure out how to work them the right way, especially with finicky fish, 
<laughs> that's the go-to lure to go to. They, you know, you could throw bait in some of those spots all day or throw some of them and they won't touch you. You throw that spook across the surface and you got that wake, they can't let it go. So, so, so right now people are writing down uh, their Amazon orders <laughs> so that they can, I know, I know for me, I yep. have never tried the crossover. Um, so I'd be interested oh, to, and it's to, got to that, one of those. It's got a crazy rattle chamber in it. Um, and you know, it kind of looks like the Missouri hydro popper. It, it, it looks like on the face there, it's yeah. But this one, the, but the the uh, the TA one, you can work it below the surface too, which is which is good because you get yeah. some of those windy windy days back on the side, and you know that they're there. The bass are there, but uh, you just can't get a top order plug to work. Right, and that, skipping that that will go through uh, right underneath the surface, and you could do that side to side motion right underneath, and yeah, it, it definitely works. But that's that's a plug that you know I think a lot of people don't use that way they just use it on top and that's it right um well, you, know, see, it, I, it, you get it to see you get to see it rather than i mean when you're going subsurface you have to feel right it's it's a little bit right, more difficult right. a little bit more nuanced than you know working in top water and and quite frankly i would probably do top water more just because it is again it's easier i can see what top it's doing i can hear what it's, it's doing addicting. yes and so addicting. And, and, and it's, seeing that and, blow up know, Correct. And, and, and going back to the strike again, you know, when you're, for me, when I'm using bait, I'm standing there, I'm watching the rod or I'm feeling the line. I'm not seeing any type of visual, you know, well, some of the biggest satisfaction I get out of going fishing is the mental picture that you capture from the experience. So uh, whether it's a top order blow up uh, strike bass here, or it's going to be, you know, a 70 inch tarpon blow up next week, cause it's happening again. Um, you know, those are, those, those are what keep bringing me back, you know, feeling taps on the line or just, you know, oh man, I took my bait. He came off again. That's fine for some people. For me, that's not what keeps me going back that, that creating the strike and, and seeing that wake come up behind it, you know, and, and you're just waiting, you're just waiting. It's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And then you stop that plug dead and they just, you know, I ambush it. I, what, what's better well, than that? Yeah. Or when they blow up on it and and then you have to start working it again and then they get yeah, it. Yeah, five uh, times, right. Yeah. And and, and the spook is, is, was great for that this year where, you know, they'd blow up on it all the way out and five times, five. And just, you know, you, and another thing with these lures, you know, don't give up at the end. A lot of people, they throw them out three quarters of the way and that's it. I, I, I work them all the way to the bank because they will chase it all the way to the bank. And just, especially if you stop it and just hit it last second. So that's one mistake I made years ago was like, I like to fish fast. I'm just a, I'm not a, a slow fisherman. I just have a, a faster retrieve. Um, but I used to say, okay, well now I'm out of the target area. So let me just get it in real quick and let me cast again. I, you can wake them up in the target area and then they'll follow it out of the target area. Yep. They'll hit it right at the bank and, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. that's definitely one mistake I made for years. I don't make anymore. I work it all all the way in. So and hold the rod tight because when they strike it right at your feet, it feels ten times harder than when they strike thirty yards out. They'll rip it right out of your hands. Yeah, you know, it, it, drag setting. You know, it, it all comes into play. It's not. Um, I, I had a, a surf bass I lost two weeks ago, and that was because of my drag setting. I wasn't expecting. Uh, cause we hadn't had a good surf down here this year. I know up North it's been, you know, on and off, but down here it's been poor to say the least, but I had a really, really nice fish hooked on. Um, he got down in the rip and, uh, yeah, I didn't back my drag off enough and, and he spit the hook and I'm sure that's probably one of the better bass that I'll, I'll have an opportunity to catch this fall. And, and I kind of lost that opportunity, but you know, the, the, the drag setting and having a, a good solid reel, that's another, uh, important thing is, is just the equipment. You got to have equipment that's going to stand up against, you know, a, a 15 or a 20 pound fish in the back blowing up last second. Cause I've had them where, you know, they'll just, they'll rip the drag right out of the reel or, uh, you know, you'll just, uh, you'll crack your reel seat or something. You just, you have to be prepared for it and you have to hold on tight. No doubt. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, we have a question. I, I want to do this question from, from Bill. Bill is actually the one that rescued Derek and I and got us back to our trucks this weekend. Nice. So. He gets extra nice. questions then. <laughs> yeah, he, he can great. send a text and, <laughs> and have any anything answered that he wants. Um, okay. So if you only go out for an hour or so, what are the optimum conditions that point to that hour to fish? So, uh, so for me, I have a couple of different side locations that the same tide doesn't work on all of them. Um, so as if I know which, uh, all right, let I me, mean, let me figure the best way to explain this. So for me, it's usually outgoing tide, but certain parts of that tide depend on what bank I'm on. Some banks, I definitely need, uh, a moon phase to be happening to get a certain water height to bring fish up on those flats. Uh, because it's a real, real, real shallow flat. Uh, but then the water is going to run out really, really fast once the tide turns. So, you know, some of those spots, it's a, it's a 25 to a 30 minute window. Um, there's other spots where, you know, you maybe have an hour or two. So to me, I, you know, you got to look at the moon. Uh, you got to look at the wind because if you have an outgoing tide and you have a wind pushing that water out, I've had it where, you know, I've gone one day and I've been waist high in water. I'll go back the following day, the same time, same tide, but with a west wind coming 15, 20 miles an hour. And that water's already blown out. So really it's just, you know, you got to know what produces uh, on that spot. Cause again, it, some side banks work the same, but you know, am I standing face in the North? My stand and face in east, stand and face in south. So, you know, do, which direction do I want the wind? A, a south wind on the side, at least for me, is never good because it just junks up the bay. It, it really uh, kicks a lot of bottom up and it just, it, 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 it muddies it up. Um, some banks, you know, I, I need a northeast wind. Other ones, I need a west wind. And there's some days if I don't get any wind, I just don't go. So um, you just really got to know that area. And that window it produces, that's what you got to pick it. I'm, I'm not trying to like beat around the question. Um, right. But you, but it, it really is just depending on, on how that bank produces. Um, so, so let I, me ask you this. Um, so you, all the, places well, I, all, all, I, all the places I fish, uh, you know, most of those fish all come from less than three feet of water. All okay, that's what I was going to ask because many yeah. people, I think, mm -hmm. in South Jersey especially, a sod bank means that it, you're standing and one foot in front of you is twelve feet deep. Well, some well, yeah, some spots are, but when that's I not what this, you're looking at. No, because this stuff isn't going to work. I mean, I'm not going to use. I, I, I'm not saying it won't work, but I'm not using a, a Zara Spook in in twelve feet of water. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the odds that they're going to come up 12 feet, I assume they will, but, um, it takes a lot of casting. Yeah, they will. Yeah, it takes a lot of casting. You know, they'll, they'll, it takes they'll come a up ton. and get it. I mean, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to use a, a, a lead head if I'm going to fish, you know, like that. But, um, no, most of these places I'm fishing, there's, there's some current there. Um, there's flats and yeah, again, uh, all the bass I hook year round, even, uh, when the tide is up, it's uh, no, no more than waist, than, than waist deep. Sometimes that water's only knee deep. So yeah. trust me, the, the, the visuals that you get when you get that strike and water that shallow from, you know, a 35 or 37 inch fish, when he's in two feet of water, he's got nowhere to go. And he's just, you know, flapping and flapping and flapping and just trying uh, as fast as he can to find that deeper water. Um you know, so the, the first challenge is just finding them. The second challenge is hooking them. The third challenge is to keep them all long enough uh, before the hooks get shaken out and they kind of get their bearings and now you start fighting them regular because that whole flipping and flaring that they do in the end, uh, in the air, that's where you lose most of the fish at. Yeah. Um, you know, spooks, it's not, it's not a great thing that they have, you know, three hooks and sometimes I remove, you know, a set of them or whatnot. Sometimes I'll go with just one set in the front. Um, 
but you know when they start flapping around then they can get a lot of hooks in them and, and whatnot but you know when you fish in the shallow water yeah it's it's a lot of it is it's, it's a small window based on just that fact right that water is not going to be there for very long um so you know you got to look at your schedule and say hey i'm going to have to give this up today or I'm going to have to change my plans around because if you, if you miss that window, you miss it. So there's a lot of things in life that I give up at certain times of the year to go out and get on these bites. Um, but that's what you have to do. You could go to the same bank that I leave an hour later and stand there for the next really 23 hours and not get a touch. Right. Some of them are just so tidal and wind dependent. It's uh, so I imagine you're catching a lot of bluefish in the spring when they're coming through. Because they're coming through uh, the same spots. Well, not the last couple of years. So, uh, well, no. <laughs> go, right. So, so going back to uh, like 16, 17, 18, well, even well before that. Uh, yeah. I, the, the same spots where I was getting bass, I was getting uh, gator blues. And, yeah. you know, that was 16 and 17 was really great. And again, I did that years ago, but I'm talking, you know, the, just the, the last couple of recent years. But um, yeah, I mean, I was getting 15 pound bluefish mixed in with those bass on flats of, of water less than three feet on top yeah. water. So um, crazy. And, and I've hooked in the ones that at least one that I've lost that had to have been pushing 20 pounds. And after, you know, 12 or 14 minutes, I had that fish, you know, three feet in front of me and I could just see like the last, the last treble was in his mouth. I knew if he shook it one more time, that was it and yeah. spit it out at me and that's it. But, yeah, you know, when we used to get the gators to come back there, it was really good. You know, a, a few of them passed through here or there, but uh, yeah, they're they're same spots, no different. Yeah. You just a lot of times it's just the you know the time of day too. Um, some days, yeah, you know, people say, "Oh, you can't get bass in the middle of the day." Sure, you can. It's just not. It's just not true. I mean, yeah. I think that for me, tide certain times of year, tide dependent uh, is more important than than light. Uh, sometimes uh, some parts throughout the year, it's definitely a dawn dusk or a cloudy day bite, but, uh, no, definitely there's, uh, you can catch big fish during the day. That's, you just have to know where to go and, and what the presentation is going to be and, and be patient. You know, you go 10 minutes, ah, oh, there's nothing here. That's not, no. Cause you know what? That current starts kicking in the next five minutes or that wind starts to pick up and puts a little chop. You could go from having nothing to, you know, a, a lights out outing. So just got to wait it out just a little bit. Yeah, I, I think they're there more than people realize. Uh, they just assume mm -hmm. because they didn't hit their two lures. Well, I, I think, I imagine that in your bag, you have a ton of different options um, and multiples of each when you head out there. So you're, you're cycling through until you're finding what's working. And then you're probably saying, well, conditions changed. I'm, I'm going to go back to the start. So, so definitely multiples of each. And I ran into that problem the other day where I lost a... Uh, uh, a hydro minnow and, and I didn't have another one with me, but I have, but I had three more out of my garage and, and I usually don't make that mistake. Yeah. Um, no, I usually bring at, at least two or three variations of the same thing. Uh, I'm not really big on the color. I actually like white and clear yeah. better than any of those. You know, the other colors are kind of pretty looking and they're, you know, nice. Uh, I, I have a lot of custom plugs from friends that are, that are plug makers and, you know, those plugs look great. Um, the craftsmanship are fantastic. I'll yeah. probably never throw them because a lot of them don't throw well anyway, unless you're out in a boat. Um, uh, but no, I, I usually bring, you know, two or three poppers, a couple of arrow spooks, a couple of subsurface and, and a bunch of plastics. Cause there's just, you know, there's some days where they don't want to touch uh, a plug. They want plastics. There's other days where they don't want plastics. They want plugs. Um, I'm never, I don't usually get caught shorthanded out there. Cause again, some of these side banks I'm walking, 15 or 20 minutes in uh better you know, have full, yeah full waders you know mosquitoes uh, greenheads mask on spray i mean you're just getting kind of tore alive but you know at the end of the road hopefully what's waiting for you and you know extra leaders extra ta clips because again i i've been in those positions where i've been on a side bank or, or you know waist deep in the river and you know you're trucking through the mud like oh my god i just got broken off and now here we go again. I'm walking back, walking back, walking. So, you know, whether it's now I carry, you know, not just one bag, but a couple bags, um, plastics in one, plugs in another, uh, a really, really good belt. So I don't have to put a shoulder 
yeah. shoulder bag on anymore. So I don't, you know, have that pressure on my neck or whatnot. I just keep everything on the waist and uh, definitely no shortage of gear when you go out there now. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, Ed can tell you, I was out with him tog fishing and I ran out of jigs. <laughs> Luckily, I was oh. with the uh, tog jig maker, and he said, "Get her over here." And, he and knowing and, and knowing how often you get you, you, you get stuck with that too, right? Yeah. And and how they dive down and fish and all that structure, and uh, you know, that's another fish. I, I hope that you know, years from now, we're not having the same conversation about tog as we do. Uh, we bass. will. I think we. You know, I think we absolutely because I don't, will. and I don't think anybody thought you know years ago we'd have bluefish. this discussion about uh, about bluefish or about sea bass. I remember as a kid coming down and vacation in Ocean City uh, with my parents for the summer, and we'd go back to 12th Street Fishing Pier on the bay in Ocean City, and we just, you know, we use squid. And we're catching, at the time, you think they're small, but, you know, these sea bass that are, you know, 15, 16, 17 inches long, you know, really, really fat. And it's like, you know, but you, that's not really the objective fish you're back there. If, you know, we were trying to catch some some bass or, or, or bluefish or big sand sharks at nighttime back there. Um, but now, I, you know, sea bass, it's like, you know, what is that? I, I don't even see them anymore. So I'm, yeah. I'm hoping Tog's not going to be the same way. But, um, again, all the uh, hoopla that gets put into Tog fishing on social media, um, I don't know. Yeah, I so I think I've I've kept one this year. Um through you know, it's funny, I threw back a, um I, I've been throwing them back. So I threw back one the other day on Saturday. Uh my buddy caught the same fish right after that. And I have video evidence of it. It was the same wow. exact fish. Caught it within twenty minutes. Which, wow. which tells me, you know, to me that was that was not only cool because he caught the same fish, but it was cool because it didn't care. It was back eating crabs. Yep. It, within, it was about 20 minutes later. Um, and it was about maybe 15 yards from where I caught it the first time. Um, and it, I'm, you know, so to me, look, catch them. If you want to go out and fish for them, catch them. And if you throw them back, they're probably going to be pretty good, you know? Um, yep. And yep. that, and that was just evidence because it had a big, a, a, a big Captain Hanks hook right through its face 20 minutes earlier, and it, it just didn't care. Uh, and, and actually, another good example of it uh, on Instagram, there is a uh, an, a an account called Drum Spots, and it shows where the mult where one one uh, red drum uh, redfish is caught multiple mm -hmm. times. They show that right. all the time. You can tell because of the spots, and yeah, they show sure. the dates. They show the dates, and you know, within a week. They're just caught multiple times. We're talking big, you know, 40 inches yeah, sure. down there. Right. Um, but I, I'm, I'm afraid that Tog's going to go the same way, though. Um, and I'm afraid Sheep's Head's going to come right behind it um, just as they're starting to establish themselves. Um, so we'll, we'll, yeah, uh, and, and yeah, and the, the Sheep's Head thing, that's, that's another, you know, that, that's such a great fish. And I think a lot of people didn't even know that they were, you know, they were up here. Yeah. Uh, until a couple years ago. Um, and I, I obviously I think they're a little bit harder to catch than Tagar. So it takes a little more yeah, a little more effort to, to catch. yeah, a little more effort to catch those and, and kind of locate them. But right. um yeah, you know, I mean listen, social media is great because it gets, you know, we get to do things like this and, and I've met so many nice people and you get to connect and but uh and you know, I uh, yeah, I mean I have that page and I post a lot of pictures. I do a lot of stuff on Instagram and you know, but I'm 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 proud of the fish I catch. I'm proud of the bites that I find. I'm I'm proud of the strikes that I create. It makes me happy. That's my, you know, that's one of my uh things in life. That's it's not just a stress relief like it is for some people. It's just it's so rewarding. I was with my son in the truck tonight and we were going to Wawa to get a sandwich and and nature sounds in my SUV. It's like one of the things that you can pick and he's like Dad, leave this on. Don't even put the radio on. And like just hearing like all these nature sounds in the background was like, he was like, wow, you know, that sounds like really cool, Dad. And I said, you know, this is what what happens when we go fishing. He goes with me sometimes. We do like the freshwater gig. But, you know, that's the experience for me is just, you know, the, the hearing, the seeing. It's not just the, 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 the fishing and the catching. Like that's a big part of it. But just that whole um, that whole experience for me. I was up on a local beach a couple of weeks ago with two buddies of mine and a woman was up there taking pictures 
And it's funny because I was joking to my friend. I said, oh, I, I wonder if she's taking pictures of the sunrise or she's taking pictures of us. So she came down to us and said, hey, I hope you guys don't mind. I'm, I'm taking some photos. I'm an art teacher. And I wanted to show my students pictures of fishermen. So I'm like, okay, sure, shoot away. So she takes like all these pictures. Most of them, you know, we're just, I think one picture we posed for. The rest of them, she's just kind of taking pictures at, at will. So I gave her my number before I left and, uh, you know, she sent me a couple of them when it was just really, really good shots today. I get a text message from the same woman and here, I guess she teaches a painting class and one of her students painted one of those photos. So that's pretty cool. She's going to have the girl sign it this week and she's going to get it to me. But it is like when you put the two together, you can't even tell the difference between the real photo and what this girl just drew. But, but like, even that day, it was so much weed on the beach. We didn't catch anything, but it was just such a rewarding experience to be out there with those guys who also don't keep anything, just true sportsmen. They just love everything about the sport. And, you know, we had that happen to us that day and it just made it rewarding even without catching any fish. So. I think the salt air has a lot to do with it. Once that, yeah. once that air hits you, it's just like, it just, yeah, everything fades away. And plus, and, and any bass caught in the surf down here is a special fish because of how much work you have to put into it yeah. nowadays. <laughs> well, well, so let's so let, let's jump into the surf real quick. Um, got a couple questions about that. Uh, let me put this one up there. Can you provide thoughts on surf fishing techniques for November and December? So last year um, was probably one of the best falls I've had in in. 15 years down here. Um, and it was, again, it was all artificials. I didn't use any, any, uh, any bait, uh, Yozuri plugs that, that hydro minnow was fantastic. Actually, believe it or not, and the no lie, the hydro minnow never came off last fall. Every single fish other than one fish I caught in a bucktail. Cause it was really, really rough one day. Every single fish last year came on that white hydro minnow. So, um, but again, you know, when you're fishing the surf, it's just like in the back. You got to know how to read the beach. You got to look for structure. You know, a, a, a flat beach, a freshly replenished beach is not a good beach. So no. we're definitely not looking for that. Um, but, you know, uh, if you kind of follow suit with what goes on up north and, you know, you look for troughs, um, you look for rips to form, uh, you know, it, to me, you kind of go at a lower tide. And you can see what the structure is because when you're, you're out there at high tide, everything looks the same. You can't really see where anything's at. But uh, I learned it by going out on a new moon on a blowout tide. Then I was able to kind of see the uh, imperfections, as to say, in the beach. And, you know, you go back and, and you fish those areas when there's more water there. And, you know, those areas, uh, at least for me, produce. I just always look for... Uh, a small stretch of beach, beach that looks so much different than the rest. All the rest that looks the same, everybody else could have that. But that that one block or two that looks different, that when I throw my lure out, if I could reel it straight in and I don't feel any resistance, I'm just going to keep moving, keep moving. If it's sweeping to the right or the left, I'm going to keep going that direction. Because at some point, you're going to find that rip. And usually that's, uh, those are the things I work in. That's where I get fish sitting. So that's, but it's, and it's that way for any beach. Again, whether it's here, you know, it's not giving away uh, anything. I'm sure there's a, a couple of my friends listening are like, oh man, why are you saying that? Why, why? It's, it, it, it's not a, listen, you can look up any on the water video or report, you know, how to read beaches. And, you know, you just, I, you just look for a section of beach that's different from the rest and has the most water flow. And, you know, that's uh, tends to be where they're going to set. And again, some guys will argue with me. No, no, no. The, the, the sun can't be out. You got to be out there in the dark. Not one of those bass last year I caught in the dark. I, I don't have any luck, at least the last two years, uh, when it's completely dark. Uh, most of those bigger ones were right at sunrise and not at first light. So as soon as I can really see where the lure is hitting the water, that's when I had the most luck. But um, yeah, just find those different uh, beaches, you know, stretch of beach that looks different from the rest. And you'll find those bass there. Yeah, I think a, a big thing is, um, you know, I say this for flounder fishing. I look for things that are different. 
Yep. Um, and, and if the water at the top is different than what the water right next to it, that means something's different on the bottom, which means structure, which means whether you're on a kayak and you have a fish finder or a boat or you're on the sod or the beach, right. you should check it out. Right. And, and see what it's doing because it's, it's those areas that are different that are usually going to be, have the different currents and it's going to push the bait fish through. It's going to sweep the forage through that area. Yep. And that's, it's always worth a look. It's always worth a look, at least for a moment, uh, toss the plug in there a few times and, and see what you can get. Um, and, and they're usually pretty active if they're sitting there in, in my experience. Correct. Yeah. You know, when, otherwise when they're, they're sitting, not going to be sitting in the current. They're going to be sitting somewhere without the current. So they're, you know, resting a little bit. So uh, last week when I was out, um, wasn't an ideal tide, but to my right, wasn't getting anything for me, but to my right, I could see it was definitely within casting range and I could see the way the waves were breaking, uh, kind of rolling over a sandbar. Um, and you know, there was a, something, some kind of turbulence being created there. And I said, man, that's look, that that's a prime spot. First cast in that spot there, the, there she was right there. It's just, you know, same thing again, we could talk about the freshwater fishing again and, and freshwater trout fishing, you know, when you catch fish in those, um, those heavy current, not, not even really heavy current, but just some type of current. Yeah, they're a lot more active. There's a lot more oxygen flowing through that water. Yep. Um, you know, they're just a lot more energetic. And, and that's still, you know, an, an ambush point, you know, right on the edge of a sandbar, whether it's on the inside edge of the bar or the outside edge of the bar, you know, the wave comes in, pushes bait in, gets washed up. You know, that's a, a prime opportunity for them to go up and feed. But, and same thing with the surf. I don't, uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of people, oh, there's, you know, it's, uh, it's not high tide. I can't go. I, I don't really get a whole lot of fish at high tide. Just a little. Hint yeah, there, but... so, so again, I'm, I'm traveling two two, three hours. <laughs> I'll get them at any tide. Um, but I think right. I have to work a lot harder, you know, if I'm there and it's high tide, I'm fishing it. Yeah. Um, but I have different spots that I go, you know, during those tides. Uh, I, I'm typically, it's deeper water stuff. There's not as much top water yep. going on. Um, but it, it's the slack tides that I think are, are the most difficult for really any kind of ambush predator, uh, like striped bass. But, but here's another, another question. So I think you, you answered this kind of top three things you look for, um, when picking a spot in the back. So I, I think you already talked about it with the surf, um, looking for the, the the changes in the water pattern and and the structure. What are the other two that you would add in there? Uh, current, wind, and 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 depth of the area I'm fishing. I think those are the three most important things. And if we want to say four, I'd I'd say the moon phase because moon acts absolutely plays such a huge factor into uh, locations in the in the back because the water can fluctuate. You know sometimes three feet from, you know, just a nonsense moon phase to uh, a super high one in the spring. But again, a lot of people shy away from that because now the areas that they're accustomed to fishing are now under, you know, water that's almost chest high. You know, I'm willing to go out of that um, and trek through it to get where I need to go. But, um, you know, because at some point on outgoing tide, that water is going to push out. And if you have some wind to help it, it's going to push out pretty fast. But um, I don't usually do good if there's no wind. Um, too much wind, I'd rather have that than not have enough wind because I can go to a spot where the wind at some point is going to be, you know, blowing against my back or, or um, not as bad of a crosswind where I could still get, uh, you know, some kind of target angle to cast at. But um, yeah, those are the those are the couple things you need to look for, I, I think. And well, and bait. Obviously, I mean, if we're talking late summer, uh, early fall, and the mullet, you know, uh, have started to do their thing in the back, um, you definitely want to target around where those mullet are at because bass are just going to key in on those, uh, especially when there's a, a baby bunker in the back. You know, you, I don't really pay attention to those. The bluefish can kind of have those, but I want to, yeah. uh, I want to target on those mullet and. And early spring, uh, same thing. If there's a uh, adult bunker back there, uh, some of those other factors may not matter as much because if they could get those, you know, get that bait pinned in, um, you know, you could have whatever kind of condition going on, but if they got the bait pinned in, that's, uh, 
you know, that's a key factor. So, you know, it's interesting. You say that the peanut bunker is not, um, I, I don't even look at that anymore because there's just so much of it out there. Um, I can't find any bass on peanut bunker. And again, I, yeah. you know, maybe it's just the select areas I go. Um, but yeah, I, I actually don't even like when I see them back there because it almost turns off the bite for me when I don't see a lot of bait. I I've had some of my best days because if those resident bigger bass are, you know, they stay in these certain areas for a certain amount of weeks at a time. And if there's not a whole lot of bait coming through and you throw that big plug coming through there, they just, you know, they're hammered at top speed because they're hungry. They got to eat. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Uh, Diesel, he wants to know what do you what do you feel about pencil poppers? <laughs> uh, I, I well, I mean, I, I use them in the surf on on calmer days, but it's been a little tough down here this fall with the wind to throw a pencil. Um, but I throw them in the back too. Uh, there's there's a lot of spots that I fish that are very very shallow, but then there's a huge drop off uh, at some point out there, and you can see some activity out there. And for whatever reason, the wind's not pushing them in or, or the bait just isn't uh, moving, those fish will not move. So th there's no doubt I'll throw a pencil, uh, a two ounce pencil back in the back off the side bank and and work it. Yeah, it's a little tough when you've got a seven and a half foot rod. Right. Um, but, you know, there's enough plug makers out there now that make uh, smaller pencils. I have some that are like an ounce and a half. They'll cast like a rocket. Um and you still get really, really good action out of them. It's a little tiring on the arm, on it, on a you know a, a, a fast action rod, because uh, I use a um, um, a pretty stiff one, because I can throw like up to four or five ounces with that rod. I use it out front. I use it in the back. It's it's just shy of eight feet. A Jig and World Nexus rod. Um, okay. So using pencils are a little tough at times, but yeah, I throw pencils in the back. You see bird activity. You see bait activity and you can't reach it, a pencil may be the only thing uh, to get it. So I always throw a, some kind of slim pencil in my bag. I always bring that. So, so okay. And you're probably, and I think you're probably like me, you'll throw a top water at any time of the day. Or do you, or do you I'll, I'll throw, I'll throw it at night. Yeah. I'll throw yeah. it at night. I mean, if, yeah. if I hear uh, some action going on, I mean, if there's some lights around or, or if it's a, uh, a full moon and I can get some light on the water. Obviously it's going to be better, but yeah, if I hear action going on, absolutely. I want to throw that because listen, they'll, they'll come up and they'll, they'll bite, they'll bite metal lips, uh, like crazy at nighttime. So, uh, yeah, a popper or even a spook like works slower. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. It doesn't matter the time of day, nighttime, uh, middle of the day. I, I always throw, uh, top order first from, right the middle of April until November. And obviously if I'm not getting anything, then I'll go subsurface, but you'll never catch a time where I go out where I don't have a top order plug on there to start with. Cause I'm not going to pass up that, that top order opportunity to get that strike. And that just that, uh, that visual picture, uh, to give it up for a subsurface lure. No. Yeah. It's, I too, was, addicting. I'm, it's too addicting. You can't give that up. Yeah. I mean, come on. That's what it's all about. Well, Ed, you're top water fish. Ed, Ed you're th you're throwing top water first, also, aren't you? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, you can't do it my any other way. Best day came yeah. on fishing a spook. Yep. Yep. I I'd, I'd look at it this way. Um, and, and Bill was asking that question in the in the chat. Um, there, I think it's a myth that they don't bite after a certain time on top water. Um. I think that it just means that uh, you didn't move spots when the conditions changed, you know, well, right. it got light out and the, and the bite turned off. Well, it turned off there, move there. Right. Of course, they're not going to be there now. It's a light out. They're going to move to this other spot. Um, but uh, I, I, I think the top waters are outstanding to start with. Yes. Um, I'm also addicted to the, the blow up and seeing it, you get the full experience, you get all the senses in there. Right. Yep. Um, but but I think it's also because the most aggressive fish are going to go after the most aggressive presentation and that's top water. It's making the most noise. It's throwing yep. off water up top. It's, 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 it's the easiest for them to see. And 
that's the one that you want to get. So I think you should always start with the top water. I do fish them at night. I fish. I, I will fish them in a new moon. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'm going to try them and I've caught at all times with it. Um, and yes, it is the most intense. I mean, you don't see people, you know, posting just a, a quick video. Look at this underwater blow up. Oh, look at how the yeah, rod bent not- when I set the hook. No, they're showing the top water. That's what everyone's clicking on because that's what everybody wants to get. And, and there's got to be something to drive you to go back. I mean, if, if every fish you missed was on a subsurface lure, um, I, I don't know if the, the, the reaction, the self-reaction would be the same. But I no. mean, when you're, you know, you miss some really, really big fish on top um, or if they don't even commit and you just see the wake, uh, that's, an, that's enough to, um, you know, uh, get, get me to, I, there, there's days, you know, I'll go four or five, six days in a row when the bite's that good, um, you know, the, the, the top order, even if it's really rough, like I said, this past spring, I mean, we were, you know, the, the, the smaller Uzuri wasn't doing it, uh, when the wind picked up. So my buddy went out, he's like, Hey, you know what, here, we're now we're going to throw these, uh, these five inch ones. And, you know, they were, they were withstanding, you know, almost white caps back there. And, you know, we'd, you know, 32, 35 inch bass just busting out of the water at them and, uh, you know, some crazy wind, but, yeah, I, I always throw it first. I never throw subsurface first. It doesn't doesn't matter. Even if I know the opportunity probably isn't going to present itself on top, I still will always throw that that, that top order lure because I, I've I've seen stranger things happen. But yeah. one thing I won't do is when when like on a really really hot day, I won't spend a lot of time throwing that top order. I'll throw it for a little bit, and if maybe ten casts, I don't get anything to commit. Then I'll go underneath the surface where. If it's dawn or dusk, uh, you know, I'll, I'll go 40 minutes or an hour. Just wait, you know, I'll, I'll stick it out with that uh, type of presentation. But when it's warmer out, yeah, I mean, I'll throw it a little bit, but then I'll go underneath the surface. I, I won't do it as long. So, right, right. Um, I think, I think top water two is a good search bait. It's a good, you get a visual representation of where you're casting along that bank. So, you know, okay, I've tried this whole area at top. I can go, you know, subsurface or I can move areas or whatever. And yep. At least for me, that's, that's a, uh, how I, how I attack it sometimes. It's kind of like using a crankbait for a, uh, for freshwater, you know, for largemouth bass fishing. It's, it's a great fish locator. You know, like you said, uh, uh, Rich, you know, they're, they're aggressive fish. Uh, that's really what I target too. I don't, I don't target fish that are, that are really not, um, ready to strike. I mean, yeah, I create the strike with the lure, but you know, it's, it's an aggressive strike. So fish are kind of just hanging out and just lazy or whatever. I'm probably not going to catch those fish because I'm not fishing a method to really kind of attract them. But uh, yeah, that top order uh, presentation, that's going to bring the most aggressive fish. And I've had it where I'm not even like to my spot yet, but I could kind of see something happening and I'll just wing it from, you know, maybe like another 50 or 70 feet away. And, uh, as soon as it hits the water, you just pop it once. And, <laughs> but you're not going to, you're not going to get that with a different lure. You're right. just not going to get the same reaction. If you, if you're throwing, you know, a, a quarter ounce or a, or, or a half ounce, um, uh, plastic tail, it, it's not going to be the same way. You, you know, they may hit it instantly when it hits the water, but that's a totally different type of of strike when you're talking as soon as the the plug hits the it hits the water and either you don't even have a chance to crank it or you just pop it once and you get that crazy explosion to to me there's just no comparison yeah i'm definitely going to agree with that um i mean that's what it's all about for me i mean you see one one big fish hit or come up and well that's the other thing you get a good sense of the size of it too and what you just missed (laughs) right (laughs) if you you don't look up Right. And, and when you're fishing in areas where, you know, there's some adjacent current or there's, you know, a, a, a rip going through, sometimes you really can't tell the size of a fish when they hit something subsurface down inside there. Um, and when you realize sometimes now it's too late if your drag isn't right. Right. Or you're not, you know, yeah, I, I've been burned way too many times on that. Yeah. Um, but even, you know, uh, tarpon fishing is, is the same way. I mean, I, I started catching them a couple of years ago on plastics. Uh, but then once I caught my first one on top order, I've haven't gone back to plastic since. 
and uh, you know that that that, that spook bite and seeing a 60, 70 inch fish uh, just fly out of the water and and engulf it. it is, you, you can't compare that to anything else in the world. Yeah, no. if I'm live line on a live boat out there, it's not it's not the same. It, it, it's just not the same. You know, the, the fight may be the same, but the initial strike. And again, that's what it's about for me is that initial presentation and take. Um, definitely uh, a league of its own. So, yeah, I, I have to agree. Let, let me ask you this. Um, I want to I want to circle back because there are a couple of people uh, want to talk a little bit more about the conservation side. Um <laughs> But before we end, uh, John Hutchinson, another member uh, of this channel, actually was asking, uh, do the inlets produce at all? What, what's your thought on the inlets versus surf versus back bays, and how would you fish those? I did. I think it depends on the time of year. Um, you know, inlets, again, you got a lot of current going through there, so that's a good thing. Um, you know, you really have to know you know, what you're doing and, and, and where you're standing at and, and, um, how to fish again, because you have sandbars, you have rips, you have troughs. So it's not the easiest place to fish, but, uh, inlets when nothing else is producing, they could be, you know, they could be lights out. I mean, that's, you know, really kind of the path that fish take when you think about it to get to the rivers in the spring, uh, to spawn, when they leave the rivers to go back out front, they have to come through the inlet again. Uh, and when fish are migrating, uh, you know, I, I can't think of a better place for, for fish to stop off and, you know, take a bite. You know, there's always current there. So inlets also draw a lot of bait. And we talked about, you know, the bait equals uh, fish equation there. So, um, yeah, I mean, inlets are a fantastic spot. It's That's a different way of of fishing yeah. so um but again some of the lures are the same you know you could you could throw you know sp minnows you could throw you know mag darters you could throw regular darters you know again if there's a lot of current you got to get something that's going to stay in that current because you want to be in that strike zone as long as possible you don't want to you know have it immediately get swept because if the fish are sitting there you know in the current regardless of the direction they're facing if you're getting swept right away, you're not even getting that fish an opportunity. So, you know, mag darters for me are uh, a, a great lure to fish and heavy, heavy current. But again, uh, you know, that's something that you need to get out there and, and, and really look at for the time of year. I don't, I don't do good in inlets in, in, in the summer, but you know, the, the fall used to be a really good bite in the inlets down here. I don't think it is really so much, but you know, we can look at, have seeking inlet this past uh this past spring the spring so was insane talk, yeah so if we want to talk about how uh how inlets produce uh you just got to look back at at the videos posted from uh this past spring i mean you know ed and a lot of my other friends that that fish atlantic city i mean these guys were just uh <laughs> it was just it's total insanity it. over there yeah. i mean yeah you know it's and again you know i i pass up a lot of nice fish because i don't i don't uh, get involved with the crowds. I just, uh, it's just not comfortable for me, but you know, the, the people that are willing to, to get in the middle of that, uh, you know, when you got, uh, some nights, you know, a, a dozen or 20, you know, 40 to 50 inch fish that are being caught. Um, so that tells you right there, the inlets do produce, but it's, okay. it's a different game though. Right. I mean, it's, it's totally different. Totally different. Yeah. You, you you know, the, the bottom it, 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 it's different gear. Um, you know, it, it, it's different setups. Uh, you really can't take a lot of your back bay equipment out there. Cause again, uh, right. you may have even a smaller window, uh, in an inlet to fish. Cause, uh, one minute you may have, uh, hardly no water between your knees and your ankles. And then 20 minutes later, now you're waist high. And now the water that you walked in to get to where you are is now overhead. So. The only thing I would tell people when it comes to that is either go with somebody, you know, who knows what they're doing or, you know, uh, find an inlet that has rocks because to yes. just do it on the sand is a totally different way. And I don't think we're going to have that conversation here, but, um, but if you're going to do it on the rocks, yeah, absolutely. Uh, spring is fantastic for him. So. 
Yeah, I actually, you know, we, we can we can circle this back around. I uh, just wanted to go through a couple of the, the comments uh, about the conservation side. I was in Absecon Inlet, but I was kayak fishing um, this spring, and a uh, guy pulled in a huge bass. I mean, he was going crazy, he and his buddy, and right. they pulled it in, and I'm like, that's too big. That's way too big. So they were right off the side, and I, I said, um, how big is it? They said, ah, we don't know. We don't have anything to measure it. So I, I said, well, I got a bump board. So I went over to him real quick thinking, God, let him get it back in the water. And I handed it to him knowing that it's way over my bump board, which only goes to 36 inches. And uh, I was like, how it's big crazy. is it? And they said, well, it's, it's bigger than the board. And so I lifted myself up. I stood in the kayak and I'm looking down. I was like, dude, that's a 50 incher. And they started cheering. I said, you got to throw that back. That's too big. You got to let it go. And uh, they started looking at each other. I was like, I know it's going to happen. I said, yep. just give me my board back. They handed it back. I'm like, I'm just telling you right now, you get caught with that. It's a big fine. Everyone's going to know your name. And man, they hammered it. Just took off, kept the damn thing. But that was in Epsecon Inlet. Um, yep. But you got to keep in mind when fishing these inlets, um, the, de the, the first of all, the currents are great, but they're also, they can be um, too much. Dangerous too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're, they're yep. definitely dangerous. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. they, they can be too much for the fish. I mean, people, you need to remember, um, think about where they would go to get the, the bait, where the bait's going to get swept, but also remember that these fish can't go to the grocery store. So yep. if, they, if they're going to eat, they have to expend their calories to get their meals. So they're not going to want to sit in a five-knot current. They're going to find uh, where the bait's coming through. They're going to go back further into the back or out front to where that that five knot current or four knot current is down to a two knot current, which is still yeah. pretty good. I mean, it's sure. still pretty strong. Um, you're not swimming out of that, but um, th and they're going to wait there because it's much less effort for them to get those those bait fish that are being swept through. So always keep that in mind with the inlets. Keep in mind also, Absecon Inlet gets to 50 feet deep. Hereford Inlet gets down to 60 feet deep. Um, yep. so it's a whole different game. You're not throwing a top water, um, as effectively in an inlet as you are right where the inlet dumps into the back bays, um, or right around the jetties, uh, that, that border those inlets. So you just got to fish them differently. Um, yeah, but to the conservation, it's a whole different experience. A whole different it is. Experience, so just got to be careful when you do it. So, yeah. And if you do decide you're not going to go on shore and you go in a boat or a kayak, uh, just be extremely careful. Um, it, bad things happen quick in in inlets uh so let's just pull it around to uh just a couple more things before we go i think we're, we're approaching we're a little over an hour and a half so um we can always ask chris to come back uh to talk more um <laughs> i could do this i could do this every night of the week so well, so could i <laughs> so could i do this every <laughs> night of the week man this is it, this is fantastic stuff yeah, my, my son would probably rebel. He just got back from soccer practice and is very quietly making his dinner, um, <laughs> giving me so like the eye. So it's funny because I, <laughs> I came in my office here and I, and I, I set up and, and I have in front of me, I have a wall with, um, I have a lot of pictures in here, but I have one wall of my, my uh, fishing in, in Punta Cana. And she's like, hey, you should kind of turn around and have that in the background. I said, you will be here four hours if I have those pictures in there. <laughs> that's another, that's, that's another conversation, whole, I, which, which I'd story. like to have sometime. I, when whole I see a six foot tarpon. Well, we could talk about that when I get back from, uh, cause I leave, uh, I'll be, I'll already be down there this time next week. So when I get back from that, I'm sure we'll have a lot of material to, uh, to talk yeah, about pictures. That. Yeah. Uh, you listen. I guarantee you, you'll have a you'll have a fifty or a sixty injured, and I, less than I'll be there less than twenty four hours. I'll have it already. So I'm, I'm dialed looking in. Forward to it. There's no <laughs> there's no failure down there. Failure is not an option. So, uh, all right. So let, let's pull this back. So um, John Davis, who's uh, actually another member uh, of the channel, so he's making the point, and and I, and a couple of other people did. Um, you know. They, they love eating fish and they'll go out and they'll, they'll catch the things that are going to stay within the, the legal limits. I, I just want to be clear. My standpoint is you're fine. Um, if, right, sure. if you're, if you're right. within the legal limits there, there's not, I'm not going to complain about that ever uh, on, on any of these things. And I know John, I fished with John a few times and yeah, he he's, he's keeping, um, I don't know that he keeps all of his fish, but, um, you know, he is definitely doing it right. And I've seen him release a bunch of fish as well. Um, and then the other point that was brought up, uh, here, let me 
just show it here. It might be easier. Three hours away, um, get less fish each year. But when he does, he wants to bring some fish home. What's your opinion? Uh, I mean, I'll start my opinion. Um, then, Ed, maybe you want to jump in. My opinion is I don't care if you're three minutes away. Um, you know, if you want to bring a fish home, I think you're – I think you're fine with it. Now, again, I will stress for me personally, and this is just me personally, and I don't judge anyone else. I'm not right. keeping a weak fish. I'm not keeping a striped bass. Um, I'm probably not going to keep a sheep's head. Um, I throw back most of the tog that I catch uh, that are keeper size, but I don't look sideways at anyone that fishes with me. That's going to keep the legal limit. Right. I may start right, to say absolutely. something if they go sure. every day and they're, they're limiting on, I may say, Hey man, give that a rest. Uh, right. You might want to think about it, but I'm still not going to get mad at them. I don't think there's anything wrong with it as long as it's within the laws. And if we don't like the laws as fishermen, we can go out to these meetings and we can work to get them changed. Sure. Um, and not enough of us do that. Uh, but uh, that's my own opinion. Ed, what's, what's your thought on that? I have a very similar thought. I mean, it's, it's your right. It's your legal right to go catch fish. If you want to keep fish, I mean, as long as you're body, abiding by the rules, I see no problem with it. You know, people that are way smarter, at least on paper, way smarter than us, you know, are modern in this stuff. And they're saying, okay, you can keep this, this, and this. Well, then, you know, go for it. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, the, the, the limits are what they are. And, and, you know, you guys are right. You know, when somebody's entitled to keep it, then, you know, that's, that's okay for them, you know? And, and, but like you said, Rich, like my personal preference is I, I like seeing them released. I release all mine, um, you know, except for one or two fish the, the last 20 years. And, and I don't, you know, I don't fault people for that, uh, for keeping, but at the same time, um, I hear some of the same people complaining when the fishery is right decimated and, you know, oh, well, I, I can't understand the way that is. You know, why is that? I wonder. You know, and, and again, a lot of that is, you know, a lot of it is uh, the back bay down here. A lot of it is from poaching. It's not from people keeping, you know, one bass here or there. And and I get the whole point that, you know, the the, the guy that with the question about the whole three hours, I, I you know, I can understand that completely. You know, my point of view is, is that, you know, I'm 10 minutes from here. You know, this is my home. These are my home waters. This is where, you know, we, we live and breathe this year. And, you know, when I go out year after year and I go to the same spots and, you know, I'm seeing less fish, less fish, less fish, smaller size, smaller size, smaller size, you know, where does that, where, where do we stop with that? So, right. you know, but like you said, Hey, listen, I, I, I respect everybody's opinion and everybody doesn't agree with me. A lot of people do. A lot of people don't. I think it's, you know, split probably uh, 60, 40 out there with people that are okay with keeping a fish and then another 40%, maybe it's 30% that, you know, think that, Hey, you know, especially striped bass, just kind of release them all at least uh, for the time being. Like I support a moratorium. I, I think that I would be okay with that, but again, I'm okay with that because I release them. I'm sure there's yeah. a lot of people that say, Hey, you know what, who are you to tell me that I, you know, you'll, make me register for the saltwater license in some states. You got to pay for that license. Uh, and then you tell me I can't keep what I catch. So right. I, I, I totally get that point. I totally understand that. But just for me personally, um, you know, I just, I just like seeing them released and see them go the other way. You know, I've caught the same fish twice uh, over the summer, uh, uh, stripers up on the flats and, you know, so that, you know, people that, well, you know, they, they migrate all the way through. Now there's a lot of fish that that's their home waters. And, you know, there's a, a few spots that I used to go to before that I can't even get a bite. Now right. they used to be like lights out spots. It's not, Oh, well, you know, that the bay changes and they just move elsewhere. And now I, I don't, I don't believe that for a second because those other areas I'm still getting the same, but I, I, these other areas, I know that it's been a, a high profile uh, poaching spot over the years and guys go back with vans at, at nighttime and they use shrimp or whatever. They get a bunch of shorts, 16, 20 inch fish, load them up, load them up, load them up. You know what? You do that for a couple of years. Well, you know, now you got a big uh, radius area that, you know, there are no, no resident fish left in there. So, yeah. Um, and I think a big thing is, um, you know, it often devolves into a commercial versus rec guy. I don't think it's legit 
commercial versus legit rec. I think it's poacher, right. commercial poacher versus uh, Absol- uh, right. recreational right. poacher. And when I say commercial poacher, I don't know that they're selling illegal fish. I, I just Buy think catch. that they... Yeah, I think the, the, maybe they're not quite following the bycatch rules, but you know, when it comes down to it, would I support a moratorium? I probably would. Um, you know, it, but but been, um, man, but I'm to your point, to it's podcast. tough to tell people you can't, right? You can't keep. Yeah, them. and 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 that's another reason why I kind of fish alone, because um, you know, I'm I'm never going to say to somebody, hey. You know, maybe jokingly, if I'm out with a buddy and he wants to keep it like, oh, you know, you really got to put that back. But a lot of guys that go with, they're not going to try and keep them anyway. But, um, you know, I I just, you know, I don't want to see it. So I just elect to go somewhere else. I'm not going to say, hey, well, you know, if you want to keep fish, you know, you shouldn't be fishing here. No, it's it's, it's not my right. You know, the the, the law is what it is and limits are what they are. And if I don't want to see it, then that's a problem for me. And I'll just go somewhere else, which which I'm okay with. And, you know, I catch plenty of fish elsewhere, but, you know, um, but, you know, th- back to what Ed said and not to kind of drag out the point, but, you know, you kind of, you know, if you see a certain thing growing up and you're kind of accustomed to, um, a certain way of life, uh, yeah, I think that rolls over into the whole keeping fish and, and spot burning is the, you know, the same thing. But I think if we didn't have as much spot burning, uh, in the back bay, I don't think the, catch rates would be kind of what they are either because i think that the the spot burn thing has kind of um exposed a lot of the not the techniques but the um mm, you know you can't go everywhere and catch them right 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 there there's more to it than just the spots you know but Um, when we're but when we're talking about exactly you know hey we're here right now and this is what we're doing. And this is, you know, I, that's just, I just have a, as a local, I have a problem with that. If, if yeah. I was a visitor, I would be all for that. I'd be like, Hey, that's great. Give me all the news. I, I'm not going to come down here and waste my time. Tell me exactly where to go. But again, when you're a local guy and you're out there just for the sport of it and you're kind of out there, you know, for peace of mind and, and to do your thing. And, and it's kind of like a, you know, a shit show. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's got yeah, a lot to do with our society too. Everybody's instant gratification and wants to know everything right, right away. Nobody wants to put the work in anymore. Nobody wants to figure out where these fish yep. are. Nobody wants to. They just want to go drop a line, catch a fish. Yeah, which I get for some people, um, uh, but there are others that really are just too lazy to figure it out themselves or, or listen to what you're telling. Like I literally on this channel will tell you how to find flounder, but you you should you should do your own work and figure it out, right? Uh, you can find your own flounder, um, but the spot burning is dangerous for um, conservation, but it's also dangerous for losing access to spots when you're talking about land-based fishing. Like to yep. me, yeah, that that is an extremely legitimate uh, point. Um, it gets a little less legitimate when you're on a kayak or uh, a boat, um, you know, it's just not as important, but man, when you're talking about access to spots and people destroying them, I, I think it's a big deal, but I think, you know, just to, from my own point, just to, to draw to a close on the conservation side, I think really the, the, the best thing that could happen is not necessarily a moratorium, but um, getting the conservation officers uh, for striped bass, get them out on the, on the, the beaches, you know, Agreed. instead of having yep. one in a 50 mile radius for Cape May County and Atlanta County, which is what the guy yep. told me a few, a couple of years ago, there was one of them. It was only him. So he gave it's me crazy. his card and his cell, his personal cell. He said, you can call me anytime, but it may take me a couple hours to get out there because it's just right. me. Um, but if you had enough of them and they were, and they were actually out on the beaches, they were out on the docks, they're out on the piers. If they were out on a boat patrolling the three mile line, Correct. which I think is the biggest Correct. violation. Um, right. The three mile line uh, of wreck fishermen. I think that's where you're going to make the difference. Um, people can hate me for that or not. It's never going to happen anyway, because they were talking yeah. millions of dollars uh, yeah. that nobody yeah. wants Listen, to spend. Listen, taxes are right. high enough here in Jersey. We can yeah. afford to hire <laughs> some more conservation <laughs> officers. All right. I was telling Chris, that's why I, I can't live. In, that's one of the big, the two big reasons that I can't live in uh New Jersey is uh, the taxes. I can't, I can't, 
Can't do it. <laughs> well, we were supposed to lose that gas tax, uh, what, a couple months ago, and now gas down here is higher than we've seen it in, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's, yeah. Oh, that, that's a whole has, different it, direction than this channel's yeah. heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's like the, the Philadelphia wage tax it was a temporary tax put in place, I think, in 1920, and it's still there. Once it's taxed, it's never going away. Exactly. Yeah, well, no, they don't, Agreed. they don't put, take away taxes. That's no. Just, no, it's free money to to politicians. So, um, all right. With that, guys, thank you, Chris. Thank you so much for coming on. I'd love to have you back on. Love to get out there and fish with you and, and learn some things from you. You're definitely um, much more skilled and knowledgeable about the sod game uh, than I am. Although I do have a ton of sod bank experience, um, I definitely learned a lot from this. So, thank you uh, for uh, absolutely. For I, I definitely look forward to fishing in the future. And and you know, for for people that. You know, it, it's just it, you you have to put in the, the commitment and you have to put in the time. You know, Ed touched on the self, you know, the, the instant gratification thing. And, you know, it's just a, a lot of time and effort and it, you know, it pays off. I mean, it's a it's a fun thing for me to do. It's a great thing that I've, you know, come to do, uh, you know, all year round. Well, except for three months or two months. We're not supposed to. Right. When we're uh, not allowed. You know, striper fish when we're not allowed. Right. Um but no, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, and I encourage, you know, people to get out there and just, you know, give it a shot and, and just figure out your own bite because it's, it's much more rewarding when you do that. But, you know, if we talked about a couple of tips tonight and gave out a little info to help people who haven't maybe been catching a lot to catch a few and kind of get hooked on it, you know, that's, that's fantastic. So good stuff. Great. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. You got it. Anytime guys. Yeah, thanks thanks so guys. Thanks for checking out the video or the live stream and asking questions and uh, we'll catch you in a couple of weeks. We'll be announcing that next topic shortly. Uh, we're still not quite sure which way we're going to go, but we'll, we'll let everyone know as soon as, as soon as we get it all nailed down and, and Chris, good luck in, uh, in DR. That's going to be your next show. When I come back, we're going to talk about that. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll, I'm sure. Oh, I'm no. sure some people, it, I mean, it's start, it's first started to feel like fall and winter this week. I'm sure people are going to want to see some nice warm weather tarpon fishing uh, 80, results 86, coming up. 86 degrees down there right now. So it's, it, it's game on next Monday night. You kidding night, me? So. I'm sitting in here in my garage with a space heater at my feet, freezing my butt off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks so everyone much, for watching. All right. We'll catch you on the you next it. one.